welcome to the TDD meetup. It's titled the ins and outs of TDD. And to get started, who am I? So my name is Olli, and I'm working at Solidas, senior software, software designer, and also as people lead, which is our name for supervisor role. So I have my own own team of developers that I'm trying to take care of. And I have been in, in software industry over 15 years already now. And I have mostly used Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, also some others, but ma mainly those. And, and TDD, I have been using something like 10 plus years. So I have some, some experience also about that. And about the presentation, so you can uh, interrupt me at any time and ask questions. So the point of the meetup is to have some discussions. It's not like me giving presentations and everybody leaves, but also have some discussions and sharing of experiences and, and all that. So please, please participate if you feel so. But to the actual agenda. So I'm going to talk about what is TDD. So kind of few facts if you don't know what TDD is, then why should you care? Uh, so wh what are the benefits of using it? So then few few ideas when not to use TDD because it's not always that good match. And then some tips about how to get started. Nothing nothing too fancy, but but some ideas. And then I will do some live coding at the end. So how it works in practice. But yeah, so the facts. So TDD means test driven development. So the, it practically has three steps. So the first step is red. So red and green refer to the colors that your IDE usually gives when you're running the tests. And if they fail, they are red. And if they pass, then they are green. So the first step is red create a failing test. So you start creating the test before you have any production code yet. And the important part here is the failing, because if your test doesn't fail, then you can't be certain that is, it's testing the correct thing. So it may very well be that, that you are testing totally wrong thing or, or something else is wrong. So make it fail. Then the second step is green, so making the test pass with minimum, um, minimal amount of code. So uh, you write some production code, and when the test pass, you are done for, for that time. So, and, and at the beginning, it's totally okay to use like hard code, some, something, just return some hard coded value or, or kind of make stupid stupid decisions and, and kind of something that you know that you will throw away. But just to get forward faster, create something that makes the test, test pass. And then there's the next step, so refactor. So when the test is passing, then you can improve the code and also including the test code if necessary. If you have only written one test, it might be that you, there's not that much, much to uh, refactor yet, but but at some point you should refactor because when you are creating those kind of quick and dirty solutions to make the tests pass, then there certainly will be need for refactoring so that the code won't be messy. But the good part is that when you have the test that is already passing, it's nice to refactor because you certainly notice if you broke the code. So if, if the tests don't pass on after the refactoring, then you know that you broke something. So that's that's a good thing there. But yeah, that's the basic loop. And after the third step, you go back to the first one. So create another failing test and then write some more code and then refactor if needed. And that's how the ball keeps rolling. And some variations of TDD is BDD, meaning behavior-driven development, or ATDD, 
meaning acceptance test driven development. So VDD is usually done in unit testing level or maybe on the integration testing level. But VDD and ATDD are more like higher level specifications. So something like closer to user stories. So, so when user logs in and clicks on something, then this and this should happen. So in that level, and then you write the code to tie up the kind of natural language uh, to the functionality. So what does it mean in your system that user logs in? So the test can, can actually lock the user in. But we are not going to talk about those in more detail today. So just to mention that these are related things. OK. So those were the facts, quite simple, but not easy. But what are the benefits of TDD? So why should you care? And kind of the obvious one is that the traditional way of doing it is I'll write the tests later and tomorrow never comes and then there are no tests and, and you just continue coding and, and <laughs> then there are no tests. So when you are writing the tests before, then of course you have those tests. It's a good thing. So that's quite obvious one. Then uh, black box versus white box. So if you don't know what this means, so black box means that you don't know what's going inside of the box or what, what the code is doing. So you only know what inputs do you give to the code and then what outputs or outputs do you get or what what happened afterwards and white box no means that you see everything that is going on in chart code so when you are doing tdd you are mostly doing black box testing meaning that when you are writing the test because you don't have the code yet you can't depend on the kind of the implementation details of the code because only thing you have is the interface so what you are going to give the code and then some assumptions what should happen after the code is run. So what should be the return value be or what kind of side effects it should have, like writing something to database or, or something like that. Uh, so a good, good point with black box testing is from my point of view that because you can't depend on the actual implementation details, then you also, the test shouldn't break if you refactor your code. Because if you are doing white box testing, that certainly quite easily happens when you have already written the code and write the tests afterwards, then you are kind of testing that, oh, there's that if statement. So so what, what happens if I give this kind of input? It should go to the, that if block and then this kind of thing should happen. So you are depending on the actual structure of the code and when you refactor and there's no if statement anymore then your tests might break so in my opinion black box testing is more more robust and better in that sense okay so as i already mentioned about when talking about refactoring so tests are your safety net so when you have tests that kind of well test that code functions as it's supposed to. Then when something breaks, you notice it almost immediately. But of course, the safety net work, you also have to run your tests. So if you only have tests and nobody's running those, then you won't notice anything. But fortunately nowadays, continuous integration servers are so common that, that there's not many projects that don't have those. So your tests Tests will be run after every commit, and then you will know if something broke. So yeah. And then iterative and incremental process. So at least I like it that I can start from some smaller problem. What is kind of the actual problem that I am solving and solve that and then continue incrementally adding more and more to the code. And, and try to solve the bigger problem in smaller pieces. And, and when you are doing 
small steps, it's easy to get forward. It's easy to get some progress. I'm getting a feeling of, of getting forward. And also doing small steps. So when the state is green, so every test is pass, it's a known good state. So when when you go forward and something breaks or you notice that, oh, this wasn't so good thing, then you can kind of roll back back to the known good state. So just throw some part of the code code away and start from the last known good state. OK. Those were the benefits. Any questions or comments at this point? Oh, I guess not. So let's get forward. So when maybe not to use TDD, it's not a silver bullet for every situation. So there are some cases when <laughs> when it's kind of obvious that you shouldn't be writing writing the tests before the code or not writing the tests at all. So trivial code is kind of well, I have seen tests written for trivial code, meaning like getters or setters or something like a function that doesn't do anything but kind of just just one thing like like setting some value. So it might not make sense to write a test that yeah, I give this value and then kind of the value is set afterwards. Because then you will get lots and lots of those tests that kind of don't test that much and then there's always the maintenance cost of the tests so if you refactor your code and, and there is not that field no not anymore so then you have have to also refactor your tests and, and be cumbersome so i don't see that much benefit in testing the trivial code but it's up to you how you want to do it then uh, if the expected lifespan of the code is really short, like doing some experiments or proof of concepts or or stuff like that, then it maybe doesn't make sense to use DDD because you are trying to do something and then when you get enough of proof that it will work, then you will throw away the code and do the actual implementation if that's the part you're going towards. So if you're going to throw away the code, then it doesn't make that much sense to invest time and money to writing the tests. But it might be beneficial at least <laughs> because I'm so used to first writing the tests. So it, <clears throat> it feels sometimes easier to write the tests also. It, it kind of helps me to think through the problem I'm trying to solve when using the tests. So, so it might make sense, but it might not. It's it's up to you, but this is one part where it might not make sense. OK, then this is getting a little bit more interesting. So if it's too hard or too expensive to write the tests, then it might be that you shouldn't be writing tests or use TDD. So some examples might be that, for example, some legacy project that doesn't have any automated tests, and then you need to implement some new feature to that project. Uh, it might take lots and lots of time to kind of set up the test infrastructure, and it might be that the code is just not testable. So it's almost impossible to test the code without doing lots of lots and lots of refactoring. So that's one example when it might not make, make that much sense. And also, if you are using some kind of framework or product that you are kind of space for your, for your uh, service or, or product, then if the product or framework doesn't support testing, it might be really hard. Use, use automated tests or TDD when writing the code. So always use the common sense 
does this make any sense to write the test beforehand because it's not like value in itself to use TDD, but there has to be some benefits using that. Okay, then a few words about how to get started. So, easy to get started, start with only one simple test. And one simple test that I usually use is something related with some kind of error case, like give null as a parameter to the function, what should happen? And it should be quite straightforward. Some exception might be thrown or some error code returned or just some empty value returned or, or something like that. So usually it's quite easy to get started with one simple test testing the error case. And then you have done the first step. And the next step is, of course, adding some more tests. And I usually continue with the error cases because they are quite easy to test. And then you are making sure that your code works well also in the cases when, the, when something unexpected or, well, in this case, expected, but so something bad happens. So it's not only about testing the happy path or happy case, but, but also taking care of the error handling. And, and that kind of creates your solution piece by piece. And, and at some point, you will get to the actual problem, kind of like what good inputs you, you should give and what, what things should happen after that. So at least I have noticed at some point that when I kind of in small steps start to solve the problem, at some point I noticed that, oh, I thought I would need to write some kind of code, but actually I didn't have to because it already supports also this use case. So that's, that's one, one thing I have noticed that might happen. Other kind of thing that might happen is that there's kind of when you have done all the easy cases then there might be the point when you kind of have to actually implement and take one bigger step before you can get the test pass and that's also okay and it might take a little bit more time but at least you have done the already the easy steps beforehand so it should be a little bit easier and you have kind of wrapped your head around the problem already you know how you, how you would like to use the code. And then remember to refactor also the tests. It's really, really important and really crucial so that you are not creating a mess. And this is also something that kind of PDD is criticized at some times. So that it creates bad designs. And, and bad architectures, and it might be so if you are if you have no clue, kind of what kind of architecture you should have, then you just can't probably TDD your way out of that. But you have to have some kind of idea what kind of architecture the, the software is going to have, and then you can create tests that kind of support your ideas. That what what kind of architecture should be, but refactoring is is really important part of creating the good designs and good architectures. So when you kind of when the code grows up and you start seeing some patterns that oh there's this and this and this happening, we should refactor it so that it it makes more sense and it doesn't have that much duplication. So that's when the safety net comes comes in again so you can do the refactorings. Also the bigger refactoring so that you can be quite certain your code still functions, even though the structure of the code has changed quite much. And then test only one thing at a time. So sometimes I have seen the tests like do something, then some assertions like this and this should happen, then do some more stuff, and then this and this should happen, and then do even more stuff, and then this and this should happen. So that's that's not a good way to write tests. So 
test only one thing at a time so that the tests are named also so that from the name you already know what is the assumption that should happen. And then the test will be easier to read, easier to maintain. Well, just more reader friendly. But yeah, that's the theory part. Next up is live coding. So I have here remade project that has two classes. It's Java, by the way, if you didn't didn't know this, but there shouldn't be any Java specific in, in this example. So if you don't know Java, don't worry, you probably still can follow. So there is the actual implementation class that will be the production code. And then there's the test class for, for tests. And then some util classes, let's see if we get to use those. But the actual assignment is that we will do a password validator so that you know that when you're <clears throat> selecting new password, there is like it should be at least some characters long and, and it should have capital letters and non-capital letters and special characters and numbers and whatnot. So this is that kind of validator that is checking if the password matches those rules or not. But yeah, to get started. So let's create our first test. So validate password should not accept. Let's start with the easy case that I mentioned. So creating test when when there's null as a parameter. So it's not yet even the method that I'm going to call. So that's one part of when doing the design. So you kind of are designing the interface. So how I would like to use this method. And so it's it's about the usage perspective, not so much about like how the implementer of that code would like it, what kind of parameters they would have, but more about what, how the user would like to use it. And then uh, null as a parameter. Let's create the method so that we get good good compiled string. Let's call it password, and then it'll it will return boolean. So so if it passes the test or not, then let's make it return some value so that the code compiles. Let's get back to test. So our assumption was that it should not accept. So let's assure that it should return false. Let's do some imports and run the tests. So it's failing. Actually, it's not <laughs> ready in here, but or it's but yeah. Uh, so let's do the quick fix. So <clears throat> let's make this return false and then Test should pass. Yay! We have implemented our first test and 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 first uh, production code. But of course, as you know, that return false is not, not very <laughs> useful. So we should write some more tests. Get things things rolling on. So it should also not accept a blank string. So So if it contains only white space like spaces and all that, so this should also be false. But now we have the problem that, that because we had to return false, then test passes. So we don't have a failing test. So let's actually fix this so that it will it will check about the null so that we get the test failing. So yeah, previous test passes and now we have a failing test so we can continue with the implementation and let's check the password is blank and not blank so yeah again tests are green and passing so we can continue forward uh, so now we have spec spec it so that null and 
blank passwords are not acceptable. Uh, then there's the requirement for for some length of password. So let's let's say for example eight eight characters. I think it's quite common nowadays. Uh, short password. So let's go over. Shouldn't accept that. See if the test is failing. Yes, it is failing. So we can continue with the invitation. So password length is greater than eight. And yeah, test is passing. And now might be a good time for some refactoring. So let's make this a constant. So minimum. Password length. That's not too short. Let's do some method. It's a little bit more readable and easy to check what it's what it's actually doing and let's run the tests again they're still passing so yay our refactoring succeeded okay let's continue forward so actually at this point we might want to check that actually it should accept a long enough password Assertion true should be long enough. Some imports needed. So yeah, it's it's not a failing test. So let's make it fail so that change that and, and just to check that it's actually yeah, it's testing the right thing. Yeah, except so let's change that. OK, let's continue to more interesting test cases. So about the should not accept this word. It okay. So actually shouldn't accept it. It's also to Yes, it's accepted. So let's make it as we can use this kind of trick. So if you want but want to check if there's capital letters, we can make the password lowercase and if it equals the password that was given, then it didn't have any capital letters because there was no change change in the password and this should no oh, should not be accepted so yeah yeah now that test passed and we have one failing test this it should accept long enough password but it doesn't have capital letters so it's failing so let's fix the test so that it matches our new requirements so now all the tests are passing again. Uh, and let's make the similar kind of check for with password with Failing. Let's create one more check in here. Let's 
used similar kind of trick. So if if we switch it to uppercase and nothing changed, then everything was uppercase already. Okay, it's, it's passing again. There is a question on chat okay. that we are validating a validator here, right? Mm. Well, we are testing if the validator gives uh, the result that we are assuming it gives with the kind of given input. So, yeah, we are testing, creating tests for the password validator. And, and also implementing it at the same time. OK, uh, so what should be our next test, test case? Maybe about numbers. So should not accept password with no numbers. It's used previously valid password. And of the tests. Yeah, so it's failing test, so it currently accepts this kind of password. And we don't want it to accept it, so let's do the check. It shouldn't. Should have some number, and let's use rec expert for that. So let's do it so that some First, it has some characters, maybe. So this means any character, and this means that zero or more times. So this uh, needs to be escaped. So that's why there is two of these. And this means a number. So there has to be some number. And then again, it can be followed by any characters. So. So this means that it should have a number. And let's run a test again. Test is passing, but or kind of accepted password is not, not acceptable anymore. So let's add one at the end. That's the usual way how we tackle these passwords. That we give the password we would like to have, and then add some one and exclamation mark at the end or something like that. Okay. Tests are passing again. So I'm looking at the clock. Should we still continue with one more case or go to the uh, already discussion part? Maybe maybe one more test. Let's skip the special character and uh, let's give that kind of kind of test case that. It shouldn't accept password that has been used before. So that's also something we can can have. So uh, in that case, we need to change the interface a little bit. So we need to have a list of, of previously used passwords at some somewhere. So let's. Do it so that list string this one previously used passwords and list of password one, password two, and password three. And so this is, let's make this a scenario. Oh, not that one. It's password, and let's give that password. Sleep used password. And now code is not compiling because there is not that kind of method. So let's actually create that kind of method. And yeah, so the kind of easy easy way would be again to return false, but let's let's skip that because 
we are running out of time. So, uh, so if this contains the password and actually, yeah. So I just mentioned that there, well, actually let's implement it. So because we shouldn't be storing passwords in a clear text format. So I have this tool called password hash util. That is, so this should be previously used password as his and not, not the actual password. But no, not that one. Yes. So let's let's do that. It's not anything fancy, so it's it's out of scope for for this exercise what it actually does, but just to make sure that nobody uh, not the password validator, but see it all. and has password. So, uh, and then we should ask this also. So, oh, I forgot to run the test. Sorry. Let's first run the test. So it's failing. Okay, and then and run it again. Mm. Oh, and it should not contain. So I made a bug in my code, but it was clearly visible. So yeah, now it works. But this, of course, it doesn't work in that sense that now it isn't checking or rest rest of the things. So we should do some refactoring. So let's copy all of these here. And then we will just use it here. So that let's validate the password and it should be empty list. So this is kind of the empty list case that we discussed earlier. And now everything should work. And still, yes, everything is working. So that's how we can continue forward with this. So thanks for participating. This was a nice opportunity to kind of share some some of my passion towards DDD and have good discussions. And thanks for asking good questions and, and challenging my my thoughts. So thank you all. <laughs>